Hi there, it's Friday the 27th of September 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to ITB. Let's get started. The European General Court, which is the lower of the two EU courts, has delivered its decisions in the EU state aid cases concerning Fiat and Starbucks. And as I'll explain, Margaret Verstager should be very happy. I'll start with the Fiat case. This case concerns a tax ruling which was issued in 2012 by the Luxembourg tax authorities to a Luxembourg finance company in the Fiat Group. The court refers to the finance company as FFT. FFT provides financial services, including loans, to Fiat Group companies in Europe other than Italy. The tax ruling endorsed a transfer pricing method for determining FFT's income from those intra-group financial services. And that income was then used to calculate FFT's taxable profits for Luxembourg corporate income tax purposes. In 2015, the European Commission concluded that the tax ruling constituted illegal state aid under Article 107 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Luxembourg and FFT each brought an action before the European General Court to annul the Commission's 2015 decision. The Court joined the two cases and this week delivered a decision which dismisses the two actions and confirms the validity of the Commission's decision. I have to say that the Court's decision is complex and difficult to read. But let me focus on the two key issues in the case. Firstly, to avoid providing a selective advantage to FFT, did the tax ruling need to comply with the arm's length principle? And secondly, if so, did the ruling actually comply? So let's start with the first issue. To avoid providing a selective advantage to FFT, did the tax ruling need to comply with the arm's length principle? Luxembourg and FFT claim that it did not. In essence, Luxembourg and FFT claim that the Commission identified an arm's length principle that is specific to EU law in breach of the fiscal autonomy of the member states and that it examined the tax ruling at issue in the light of that principle, without taking account of Luxembourg law. The court disagreed. In the context of determining the fiscal position of an integrated company, which is part of a group of undertakings, it must be noted at the outset that the pricing of intra-group transactions carried out by that company is not determined under market conditions. That pricing is agreed to by companies belonging to the same group and is therefore not subject to market forces. Where national tax law does not make a distinction between integrated undertakings and standalone undertakings for the purposes of their liability to corporate income tax, that law is intended to tax the profit arising from the economic activity of such an integrated undertaking as though it had arisen from transactions carried out at market prices. In those circumstances, it must be held that when examining, pursuant to the power conferred on it by Article 1071 TFEU, a fiscal measure granted to such an integrated undertaking, the Commission may compare the fiscal burden of such an integrated undertaking resulting from the application of that fiscal measure with the fiscal burden resulting from the application 
of the normal rules of taxation under the national law of an undertaking placed in a comparable factual situation, carrying on its activities under market conditions. The arm's length principle, as described by the Commission in the contested decision, is thus a tool for making that determination in the exercise of the Commission's powers under Article 1071 TFEU. The Commission also stated, correctly, that the arm's length principle was a benchmark for establishing whether an integrated company was receiving, pursuant to a tax measure determining its transfer pricing, an advantage within the meaning of Article 1071 TFEU. The Court also held that the OECD transfer pricing guidelines are relevant in applying the arm's length principle. Even though the Commission correctly observed that it cannot be formally bound by the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, the fact remains that those guidelines are based on important work carried out by groups of renowned experts, that they reflect the international consensus achieved with regard to transfer pricing, and that they have a real practical significance in the interpretation of issues relating to transfer pricing. And so the court concluded on the first issue, consequently, the Commission correctly concluded that it was entitled to examine, in the context of its analysis under Article 1071 TFEU, whether intragroup transactions were remunerated as though they had been negotiated under market conditions. And now to the second issue. Did the ruling comply with the arm's length principle? The ruling adopted the methodology and results from a transfer pricing report which was prepared by FFT's tax advisor. That transfer pricing report used the transactional net margin method, TNMM, with the profit level indicator being return on equity. The transfer pricing report focused on the 2011 year. In that year, FFT had equity of 287.5 million euros. The transfer pricing report divides that equity into three components. The first component is called minimum equity at risk. This is FFT's hypothetical regulatory capital of 28.5 million euros, which was estimated by the tax advisor by applying the Basel II framework by analogy. The second component is called equity backing the functions performed. This was estimated by the tax advisor as 93.71 million euros. And the third component is called equity supporting financial investments in Fiat US and Canada subsidiaries, which is stated to be 165.244 million euros. In regard to the first component, minimum equity at risk, the tax advisor applied a return of 6.05%, which was estimated using the capital asset pricing model. That gave a so-called risk remuneration of 1.726 million euros. In regard to the second component, equity backing the functions performed, the tax advisor applied a return of 0.87% which was an estimate of the market interest rate on short-term deposits. That gave a so-called functions remuneration of €816,000. And in regard to the third component, equity supporting the financial investments in Fiat US and Canada subsidiaries, the tax advisor determined that the remuneration should be nil. And so the transfer pricing report estimated FFT's taxable base to be 2.542 million euros and the tax ruling adopted that number with a range of plus or minus 10%. 
in its 2015 decision, the Commission identified five errors in the transfer pricing methodology, which was endorsed by the tax ruling. The court said this in its press release, which summarises its decision. The court concludes that the Commission correctly found that the arrangements for the application of the TNMM endorsed by the tax ruling at issue were incorrect, and specifically that the whole of FFT's capital should have been taken into account and a single rate should have been applied. In any event, the Commission also correctly considered that the method consisting, on the one hand, in using FFT's hypothetical regulatory capital, and on the other hand, in excluding FFT's shareholdings in the Fiat US and Canada subsidiaries from the amount of the capital to be remunerated, could not result in an arm's length outcome. And now to Starbucks. This case concerns an advanced pricing arrangement, APA, which was issued in 2008 by the Netherlands Tax Authorities to Starbucks manufacturing EMEA BV, a Netherlands company in the Starbucks group. This simplified diagram shows the relevant transactions. The taxpayer, SMBV, purchases green coffee beans from SCTC, a Swiss company in the Starbucks group. SMBV roasts those beans and then sells the roasted beans to Starbucks coffee shops in the EMEA region. SMBV also purchases finished goods such as food, tea and cups from third party vendors and it on sells those finished goods to the Starbucks coffee shops. In addition, SMBV pays a royalty to Alki LP, a UK limited partnership in the Starbucks group, for the use of coffee roasting IP. The AP covered two related topics. Firstly, SMBV's remuneration for its roasting and distribution activities, and secondly, the amount of the royalty paid by SMBV to Alki LP. In 2015, the Commission concluded that the APA constituted illegal state aid under Article 107 of TFEU. The Netherlands and Starbucks each brought an action before the European General Court to annul the Commission's 2015 decision. The court joined the two cases and this week delivered a decision in favour of the Netherlands and Starbucks and which annuls the Commission's decision. The court's decision in this case is similar to its decision in the Fiat case, complex and difficult to read. So again I will focus on the same two key issues. Firstly, to avoid providing a selective advantage to SMBV, did the APA need to comply with the arm's length principle? And secondly, if so, did the APA actually comply? Well, my discussion of the first issue will be quick. The court, not surprisingly, expressed the same views on this first issue as it did in the Fiat case. So that means that yes, to avoid providing a selective advantage to SMBV, the APA did need to comply with the arm's length principle. So now to the second issue. Did the APA comply with the arm's length principle? In its 2015 decision, the Commission identified several errors with the APA. Firstly, the APA used TNMM and not the comparable uncontrolled price CUP method. In the Commission's view, this was an error. Secondly, the Commission found that the transfer pricing report on which the APA was concluded did not contain an analysis of the royalty paid by SMBV to Alki LP. 
Thirdly, the commission considered that the amount of royalty should have been zero. Fourthly, the commission considered on the basis of SCTC's financial data that SMBV had overpaid for the green coffee beans in several of the relevant years. And finally, in the commission's view, the detailed rules for the application of the TNMM as endorsed by the APA were erroneous. All of these errors were rejected by the court. I'll take you through what the court wrote in its press release summarising its decision. The court wrote this. As regards the error identified by the Commission in respect of the choice of the TNMM and not of the CUP method, the Court finds that the Commission did not invoke any element to support as such the conclusion that that choice had necessarily led to a result that was too low, without a comparison being carried out with the result that would have been obtained using the CUP method. The Commission therefore wrongly found that the mere choice of the TNMM in the present case conferred an advantage on SMBV. Likewise, the Court states that the mere finding by the Commission that the APA did not analyse the royalty does not suffice to demonstrate that the royalty was not actually in conformity with the arm's length principle. As regards the amount of the royalty paid by SMBV to Alki, according to an analysis of SMBV's functions in relation to the royalty and an analysis of comparable roasting agreements considered by the Commission in its decision, the Court finds that the Commission fails to demonstrate that the level of royalty should have been zero or that it resulted in an advantage within the meaning of the TFEU. As regards the price of green coffee beans, the court notes that the price of those beans was an element of SMBV's costs that was outside the scope of the APA, and that, in any event, the Commission's findings did not suffice to demonstrate the existence of an advantage within the meaning of Article 107 TFEU. The Court notes in particular that the Commission was not entitled to rely on matters subsequent to the conclusion of the APA. It finds that the Commission did not demonstrate that the various errors it identified in the detailed rules for the application of the TNMM conferred an advantage on SMBV, whether as regards the validation by the APA of the identification of SMBV as the tested party for the purposes of the application of the TNMM, the choice of profit level indicator or the working capital adjustment and the exclusion of the costs of the unaffiliated manufacturing company. And so in regard to the second issue, the court concluded that the commission had not demonstrated that the APA did not comply with the arm's length principle. And therefore, the Commission had not demonstrated that the APA gave SMBV a selective advantage. Both the Fiat case and the Starbucks case represent significant victories for the Commission, despite the fact that it was ultimately unsuccessful in the Starbucks case. The reason is that, in both cases, the Court accepted the Commission's view that where national tax law does not make a distinction between integrated undertakings and standalone undertakings for the purpose of their liability to corporate income tax, that law is intended to tax the profit arising from the economic activity of such an integrated undertaking as though it had arisen from transactions carried out at market prices. In other words, the arm's length principle applies, 
regardless of whether or not the national tax law of the member state expressly includes the arm's length principle. And if a tax ruling or APA does not comply with the arm's length principle, a selective advantage under Article 107 TFEU can be found. For a copy of the two decisions and the two press releases issued by the court, a copy of the two commission decisions issued in 2015, and a copy of Margaret Vestager's statement on the two court decisions, please go to our website or app. In Austria, the bill for the 5% digital advertising tax has been passed by the lower house of parliament. The next step, of course, is the upper house. The US trade representative has issued a statement concerning ongoing trade negotiations between the US and Japan. For a copy of the statement, please go to our website or app. The OECD has released two items. The first is the 2019 annual report for its Tax Inspectors Without Borders initiative. And the second is a preview of an upcoming report called Taxing Energy Use 2019. For a copy of both items, please go to our website or app. In Australia, remember the full federal court's decision in the RCF4 case in April this year? It concerns a reverse hybrid partnership, the Australia-US double tax treaty and Australia's land-rich provisions. Well, that decision is the last word on the dispute. The High Court, which is Australia's highest appellate court, has refused special leave to appeal with a statement that there was no reason to doubt the correctness of the full federal court's decision. Also in Australia, the tax authorities have released for public comment draft guidance on the transfer pricing issues related to non-resident owned mobile offshore drilling units in Australian waters. Public comments are requested by the 25th of October. For a copy of the draft guidance, please go to our website or app. In India, the GST Council has made some changes to GST rates. Two of the changes have caught my eye. Firstly, in order to promote tourism, the GST rate on some hotel services will be reduced to 18% and on catering services to 5%. And secondly, the GST rate on railway equipment such as wagons, coaches and rolling stock has been increased from 5% to 12%, a move which has been welcomed by the industry. If that sounds counterintuitive, it actually makes sense. Many of the inputs carry a GST rate of 12% or even higher. This is called an inverted duty structure. The differential in rates between the input tax and the output tax is not refundable. It's a cost borne by the manufacturer of the railway equipment. By closing the gap, that cost is reduced. And speaking of rate changes, next Tuesday, the 1st of October, is the main switchover date for the increase in the rate of Japanese consumption tax from 8% to 10%. I say main switchover date because for some products, the 10% rate is already being charged correctly for advance payments. The Japanese newspapers are carrying stories of irate consumers. For example, advance payments for purchases of school backpacks and kimono rentals are already subject to the 10% rate. In New Zealand, the government has announced two income tax law changes. Firstly, feasibility expenditure will become deductible. 
either over five years or immediately if the expenditure is less than 10,000 New Zealand dollars, which is just over 6,000 US dollars. And secondly, the shareholder continuity rules for the carry forward of tax losses by a company will be amended to ensure that they allow startups to raise new capital investment. A public consultation on these two changes will occur later this year, together with a review of the existing R&D tax loss cash out rules. For a copy of the government's announcement, please go to our website or app. In the Czech Republic, it's been reported that several large banks have agreed with the government to set up and invest in the National Development Fund, which will invest in highways, hospitals and schools, and thereby avoid the government imposing special taxes on them. And now to Denmark. In last week's ITB, I discuss the draft bill which the government has released for public comment by the 10th of October. The draft bill covers a number of topics, but it's the transfer pricing documentation topic which has generated lots of interest this week. Firstly, the bill would require that a taxpayer's transfer pricing documentation be submitted to the tax authorities together with the income tax return. And secondly, if a taxpayer fails to submit the transfer pricing documentation by the returns deadline, not only will there be penalties, as you would expect, but the tax authorities will also be permitted to freely estimate the taxpayer's taxable income, a so-called discretionary assessment. For a copy of the relevant documents, please go to our website or app. In France, the government has presented its 2020 budget, which includes significant tax reductions for individuals and somewhat smaller tax reductions for companies. In regard to companies, the government is still gradually reducing corporate income tax rates with the ultimate objective of reaching 25% by 2022. For 2020, there will be two corporate income tax rates. 28% if the company and its group have a turnover of less than 250 million euros and 31% if the company and its group have a turnover of 250 million euros or more. In Germany, the government has announced its Climate Protection Programme 2030, which includes several interesting elements. The extension of the emissions trading scheme to the transportation and heating fuel sectors, an increase in aviation tax, and a decrease in the VAT on long-distance train tickets from 19% to 7%. For a link to the Climate Protection Program 2030, please go to our website or app. Also in Germany, the Upper House of Parliament has released its opinion on the government's draft bill to amend the real estate transfer tax. The Upper House generally supports the draft bill, but suggested some changes. Firstly, introduction of an exception for publicly traded companies to avoid the situation where public trading causes a RET liability. Secondly, broadening the intra-group restructuring exemption. And thirdly, changing the 10-year monitoring period so that only share transfers after the 31st of December 2019 are included. The government has not yet issued its response to these suggested changes. And finally in Germany, the Federal Tax Court has decided a case in regard to the possibility of a 100% exempt repayment of capital by a non-EU subsidiary to its German parent instead of a 95% exemption. 
although German tax law contains a formal approval procedure for a repayment of capital by an EU subsidiary to qualify as 100% exempt, the approval procedure does not extend to repayment of capital by non-EU subsidiaries. It was thought that the absence of an approval procedure meant that the repayment of capital by non-EU subsidiaries cannot be 100% exempt. The court rejected that view. It held that the repayment of capital needed to be analysed under the relevant foreign accounting and corporate law and the German earnings and profits ordering rules, regardless of the absence of an approval procedure. For a copy of this decision, please go to our website or app. In Norway, the National Tax Assessment Board has given its decision in a case concerning the Norway-US Treaty. A pension fund established in the US in the form of a trust received dividends from Norwegian companies. Under Norwegian domestic law, a 25% withholding tax was imposed. However, under the dividends article, Article 8 of the treaty, the Norwegian tax on dividends paid to a resident of the US is limited to 15%. The pension fund therefore applied for a refund of 10%. The key issue in the case was whether the pension fund satisfied the definition of resident of the United States in the treaty. That definition is in Article 3.1.B.2, which relevantly says this, any person resident in the United States for purposes of its tax, but in the case of a partnership, estate or trust, only to the extent that the income derived by such person is subject to United States tax as the income of a resident. The board accepted that the dividends were not subject to US tax in the hands of the trust. It also accepted that the trust paid pensions to the underlying investors who were generally US resident individuals and that these pensions were subject to US tax. The board concluded that the trust did not satisfy the definition of resident because the dividend income was not subject to tax in its hands. Also, the board stated that the fact that the pensions were subject to US tax in the hands of the underlying investors was not relevant because the pensions were a different character of income from the dividends. And so the board held that the tax rate limitation under Article 8 was not available. For a copy of this decision, please go to our website or app. In the UK, the First Tier Tribunal has decided a VAT case concerning the American Express Group. The taxpayer is American Express Services Europe Limited, AESEL. That company is a card issuer. In that role, AESEL made supplies of payment services. The issue in the case was the identity of the American Express company to which those services were supplied. There were two possibilities. American Express Travel Related Services Company Inc, AETRS, which is established outside the EU, and American Express Payment Services Limited, which is established in the EU. AESEL's payment services are exempt from VAT. However, if those services were supplied to a company established outside the EU, AESEL was entitled to input tax credits. But if the services were supplied to a company established in the EU, AESEL was not entitled to input tax credits. The relevant input tax credits in the case were significant, £57 million. In identifying the company to which the services were supplied, the tribunal adopted a two-step approach. Firstly, the contractual position is assessed. 
And secondly, the economic reality of the transactions is considered. In this case, both steps pointed to the services being supplied to AETRS. And so AESEL was entitled to the input tax credits. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Ukraine, a bill to amend the tax law has been submitted to Parliament. Two items caught my eye. Firstly, the introduction of CFC rules. And secondly, a fundamental change to the existing interest limitation rules. Those rules currently apply only to interest paid to non-resident related parties. However, the bill will extend the rules to all interest payments. And now to South Africa. In last week's ITB, I discussed the recent BMW case in South Africa, in which the Supreme Court held that tax compliance services provided free of charge to expatriate employees constituted taxable income for the employees and are therefore subject to income tax. The court didn't have to consider the VAT aspects of the free tax compliance services. However, this week, some commentators have suggested that a VAT liability would generally arise for the employer company in this situation. In the US, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration has issued a report which assesses the IRS's implementation of the international provisions in the 2017 US tax reform legislation. For a copy of the report, please go to our website or app. And the Congressional Research Service has issued another report on US trade topics. This one is called China's Retaliatory Tariffs on US Agriculture, in brief. For a copy of this report, please go to our website or app. And now for this week's treaty developments. We've had two treaties signed, one treaty enter into force and two protocols enter into force. I have one article for you this week. It's called How US Tariffs Affect Transfer Pricing and What Companies Are Doing. It's written by Stephen Rapp and Marin Glenn Marku, and it's published in Tax Notes Today International. This article addresses two main issues. Firstly, it describes how tariff costs affect US transfer pricing analyses. And secondly, it examines the best options available to companies in the absence of meaningful guidance from the Treasury or the IRS. In regard to the first issue, how tariff costs affect US transfer pricing analyses, the authors conclude in this way. Tariffs create additional complexity and undermine the reliability of transfer pricing methods. Lack of sufficient information about comparable supply chains and the extent to which they are affected by tariffs makes comparisons potentially unreliable and exposes taxpayers to transfer pricing risk. Traditional benchmarking analyses, whether under transactional methods such as the resale price method or profit-based methods such as the comparable profits method or CPM, fall short because they do not capture the diversity and complexity of supply chains or changes in the risk profile. 
Further, the incidence of the tariffs and the ability to pass them on to customers is difficult to detect in the financial statements of public companies. Although taxpayers may have detailed information on the amount of tariffs incurred on a related party transaction, the amount passed on to customers, and the amount shared with related parties, the absence of similar information for comparable companies raises concerns about the reliability of that comparable information and the application of the resale price method and the CPM. Finally, there is the issue of timing. The recently enacted tariffs represent a new material cost that did not exist in 2017, adding another dimension of complexity to multi-year transfer pricing analyses. And in regard to the second issue, best options available to companies, the authors write, one potentially effective and reliable approach to address tariffs would be to carve out the tariff effect from the operating results of the tested party and comparables and move it below the operating profit line. Ideally, we would want to make this adjustment to both US tested party financials and the comparables financials. Another approach is that companies with material transactions may wish to seek an APA that clearly addresses tariffs. This approach can be particularly effective in a bilateral setting because we would expect foreign tax authorities to push for a carve out of the tariff costs from the operating profit of the US tested parties. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 27th of September, 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend.